Namaste. Uh, very good morning from Kathmandu. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Uttam Babu Shrestha. I'm an environmental scientist by training. Uh, I used to be a Nepali diaspora before, but now I'm a region in Nepali. After spending 15 years abroad, I returned to uh, Nepal and founded a research organization uh, called Global Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies where I'm currently serving as a director. I would like to thank NRN uh, Second um, Global Convention Organizing Committee uh, for this opportunity. Uh, today, I would like to invite and welcome you to this third plenary session on science, technology, and innovation policy implementation of the Second NRN Global Knowledge Convention. The session is jointly coordinated by Dr. Suresh Dungel uh, from NAS and myself. In this plenary session, we'll be discussing on three key aspects. The first is Nepal's science technology and innovation policy, STI policy, and current existing uh, environment of doing scientific research in Nepal. And uh, we'll be talking about the excellence in science. So this two hour long plenary session is divided into two halves. In the first half, we have a keynote speaker and two invited presentations. Uh, and the second half comprises uh, panel discussions. So um, as you have seen in our program booklet, we have three excellent plenary speakers and wonderful panelists uh, in today's plenary session. Um, Actually, we have recently uh, have the STI policy and unlike other policy documents that is prepared in Nepal, this policy was co-produced after several rounds of discussion at multiple scales and consultation with the experts in Nepal and abroad. We are lucky to have Dr. Dinesh Buju, who was uh, the leader or the coordinator for drafting STI policy as a keynote speaker in today's session. Secondly, in recent times, you know, there is a small trend that, uh, you know, people from abroad, uh, like uh, Nepalese diaspora, are returning, um, particularly, you know, who are working in the scientific research, they are returning Nepal from overseas, and these returnees are conducting research through a startup by joining government research organization like NAS. And we have two young invited speakers, Dr. Ram Chandra Powdell from NAST and Dr. Basant Agri from Kathmandu Institute of Applied Science, KAYAS. And Dr. Giri is co-founder of KAYAS. It's a startup. And these speakers will share their knowledge, experience on the barriers and enablers of science and research exist in Nepal, but also discuss you know, how to foster best practices and excellence in science. And the role of diaspora communities in enhancing science excellence in Nepal. I will coordinate, as I said, the first half of the program and Dr. Dungel will coordinate uh, the panel discussion um, if uh, everything goes okay. So without further delay, um, we also have uh, in today's um, uh, speaker list, we also have Dr. Sanjay Sarma, um, the Secretary of Government of Nepal uh, for the Education, Science and Technology Ministry. So uh, without further delay, uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Sanjay Sarma to chair the session. Um, and uh, I'm going to read his a brief uh, introduction or bio. So Dr. Sanjay Sarma is currently a Secretary to the Government of Nepal for Education, Science and Technology Ministry. And Dr. Sharma is specialized in hydraulic engineering and he received his PhD in civil and environmental engineering in 2003 from the University of California, Davis, US. Uh, before attending UC Davis, uh, he obtained a master's degree in engineering from the University of Rurke, uh, now, um, well known as IIT Rutli, so where he was awarded a Chancellor Gold Medal. So he's an extraordinary um, civil servant of Nepal, and we are lucky to have him uh, as a 
secretary in the right um, uh, ministry um, that is education, science, and technology. So normally, you know, the session chair um, uh, is uh, supposed to, you know, run this um, uh, uh, session, but um, because this is the virtual uh, nature of conference, so I am helping this task um, to Dr. Sharma. So uh, please welcome Dr. Sharma. Thank you. Thank you, Uttamji. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, now can I start, uh, sir? Please, 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 please go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharma. <clears throat> so uh, we, as you see, we have a very tight schedule and I would like, to, uh, without further delay, I would like to invite today's uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Dinesh Raz Buzu. Dr. Dinesh Raz Buzu is an academician and management council member of Nepal Academy of Science and Technology, NAST. He was the coordinator of a committee formed by Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, Government of Nepal for the formulation of National STI Policy 2019. He currently works as an adjunct faculty in the Tribun University Agriculture and Forestry University and Midwestern University of Nepal, as well as Northwest University of China. During his uh, more than three decades of service as NAS, he provided leadership as, uh, as the chief of the Faculty of Science, as well as the chief of promotion and publicity division. And he remains a very popular science communicator in the country uh, due his long affiliation to radio and television program produced by the NAS. Actually, my generation, like me, uh, were greatly inspired by listening to him uh, and his voice in radios, seeing him TV, and one of the many sources of inspiration for me, um, particularly to be a scientist, is uh, the radio program run by Dr. Buzu and his team that ignite curiosity in my childhood to be a scientist. So Dr. Buzu completed his uh, master's degree in botany from T Tribune University, Nepal, um, and PhD in ecology from Chiba University, Japan. Uh, he published several research articles in reputed international journals and popular articles in magazines and national newspaper. And he is the leading corsetor for science popularization and institutionalization of scientific culture in our society. And it's really an honor for me um, to um, have Dr. Vuzu uh, in, in this plenary sessions. And thank you, um, uh, Dr. Vuzu, for agreeing our invitations. And now the floor is yours. Uh, please welcome Dr. Dinesh Raz Vuzu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sreska and Dr. Dungil. It was um, a very towering introduction of a dwarf person like me. Uttam, you talked the story of the past. If I stand on the present tense, you are my inspirator. You are my inspiration. Your generation is my inspiration. That's why I'm standing here today. Namaste, respected chair of the session and all friends from Nepal and abroad. I have a few presentation slides, but let me begin without them. I want to be heard clear and loud. I have this privilege to make a keynote address. In doing so, I find myself a little nervous and flattered. As such, I'm not a policy specialist, but a science practitioner. I enjoy talking science philosophy with my grad students and immersing myself and interpreting my tree line ecology data from the Himalaya. 
Nevertheless, I have my interest in science policy, as you all have. And Nepal has seen three editions of science policy. The first one was graduated in 1989, the second in 2006, and the third unveiled in 2019 is in your hand, this one. When the first science policy was formulated, I was its translator. Yes, the original draft of the policy was in English. And I translated into Nepali. It was a great privilege for me. I was a young chap in that time, like Uttam. The second edition, like the first one, was presented in a national conference. And I was moderating the session, the conference. And coming to this third edition, I was a lucky guy to coordinate the draft committee. What a game of the time. A policy is a process, not a mere document. It starts from formalism, enters into implementation phase, and is revised and reviewed to address the priorities of the change system, I mean the political system. Dr. Amir Bahadur Sesta, the main architect of the first science policy draft, told me so. Dr. Sresta was the first executive director of RECAST, Research Center for Applied Science and Technology. RECAST was created back in 1970s to become more than a teaching institute. It was also the secretariat of the National Council for Science and Technology, NCST. The original NCST, that is the council, is no more now nor the original recast, which is now a wing of Trivavan University. Therefore, Dr. Srester was the first and the last executive director of recast, who was not the university faculty. I'm mentioning all this because in Nepal, we conceive ideas, formulate policy, and get disoriented while implementing them. In 1968, the government of Nepal, that time it was His Majesty's government of Nepal, sought the assistance of UNESCO to formulate a science policy. The UNESCO team submitted a report with a recommendation well, there were many recommendations, but one of the recommendations was to form a national science board under the direct leadership of the prime minister and its secretary general, please note my word, was to be a scientist or an engineer. Not necessary from within the government mechanism. A body was created, which I mentioned, NCST, National Council for Science and Technology, but not under the Prime Minister as suggested or recommended, but under the Vice Chair of the National Planning Commission. NCST could not work well. It was dissolved before it could formulate a science policy which was bestowed upon NCST. The first science policy, therefore, was formulated by NAST. At that time, it was RONAS, Royal Nepal Academy of Science and Technology. I still remember the vice chancellor of the NAST himself presented it in a large gathering of the scientists and technologists in the first national conference of science and technology in 1988. And then it was in 1990, we saw the reinstitution of the multi-party system in Nepal, as you all know. Many did not notice the science policy. Some knew it, but took it as a legacy of the dying panchayat system. Therefore, better forget than implement. When the second time the science policy was brought, we already had the Ministry of Science and Technology. But it was late to bring the science policy 
the government was engaged in insurgency and a huge political upheaval was in progress. After the Shipia, that is Comprehensive Peace Agreement, the ministry formed a task force. I was called in the team. We did some homeworks, but decided to wait for the new constitution to come. After all, a science policy or any other policy goes in tandem with the nation's political system, as you know it. So in, 19, uh, so in 2015, there was the earthquake, and also we had the new constitution promulgated. And it was followed by general elections. With the constitution in place, the government formed a three tiers. It was at municipality level, provincial level, and somebody says central, but it is federal. So it was a high time for us to review the science policy and bring a new one to gear our science and technology towards achieving the people's aspiration of economic prosperity and social transformation. A draft committee was formed in 2018. Earlier, we had a nationwide consultation in all seven provinces for priority determination and also to know the status of science and technology in the country. I did all facilitation of the consultation meetings and the secretary, Dr. Sanjay Sharma, who is chairing this session now, was our supporter and a motivator. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. In total, we had 479 participants, please mind it. That was in the first round. Over 250 questionnaires and interviews collected. Then the policy draft committee was formed in October, just after that consultation in 2018. We published, after the formation of this committee, a public notice in a daily newspaper, maybe for two days, I think, and sent letters to all 753 local governments, that is the municipalities, and all seven provincial governments through the cabinet, through the government of Nepal. And also we sent letters of request to dozens of departments we also sent hundreds of emails, including Nepali diaspora. Some of you had got it, and also I got your feedback. Thank you all. We conducted 14 consultation meetings covering all seven provinces. The participants included parliamentarians, academicians, professors, teachers, scientists, engineers, practitioners, and of course, young and experienced. And we had intensive team workshop. Sometimes we quarreled actually. Dr. Tringel might be recalling it. It was perhaps the first such massive process in the process of any policy in Nepal. I beg your pardon if I'm mistaken. So the policy was unveiled by the Prime Minister of Nepal, no other person. On what day? On the National Science Day, Ashin Yek. Present at the occasion were former Prime Minister, Minister of Education, member of National Planning Commission, and NAST Vice Chancellor. Who do you need more to witness? Earlier, we had a national conference in the presence of the Deputy Prime Minister, who is still the <coughs> Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. So we left no stone unturned. I'm sure my team will agree with me. So that was the birth of the present STI policy, this policy. I still feel the pang of its birth on the science day this year. It has turned one year, first anniversary. The question is, has it been nurtured? Has it been cared for? Has it been enough nourished? And how many milestones we have instilled? 
So the process of policy implementation is not an easy job. I know it and you know it. In a quick check last night, I found a good number of 6,000 journal papers in Science Direct. Imagine in last 20 years, 25 years. There are hundreds of reports, textbooks, and references. All renowned universities, you take name, Harvard, Oxford, Xinhua, Cambridge, Seoul, you take name. They all offer courses on science policy and science policy implementation. It simply means there is a huge interest in policy implementation because there are problems and of course there are solutions. Well, many examples could be there and are there. It's a matter of perception. You also have a lot of examples I know. The only difference is that I'm having this privilege to speak now. Otherwise you can give hundreds of examples on how science policy is successfully implemented or how science policy is not implemented, both. Here I have an example from Brazil, the Latin American uh, country and emerging economy. Brazil prepared a national policy of health, a part of science policy back in 2003. The policy formulas involved, please note my words, the numbers. The policy formulation by Brazil, policy formulation of the health science involved 510 researchers, policy makers, and 15,000 participants from 307 cities and 24 states. A national conference was organized, which approved the policy in 2004. So it took at least two years. And one of the priority agendas was the government, that is Brazilian government's investment in research and development. In a year, in one year, 24 calls for proposals were launched. That is at least twice a month. And 1,300 research proposals were financed. The Department of Science and Technology alone, because there are many other departments, but this department alone invested 25 million US dollar on health research and development work. So there's the story of Brazil and emerging economy. Now let me share some of my slides. Just a moment, please bear with me. Okay, I think uh, I should also. Huh. So here you have, uh, just a moment, this is uh, uh, making me problem. So I stop my video so that, uh, you know, it will be easy for me to describe it. Please hold me. So I was talking about Brazil. It was just to give, uh, give an example because there are 215 countries in the world, but this is just one example. Then what institutional modality would be the best for policy implementation? This could be a good question for you, but unfortunately, I warn you, there is no single model that fits all which you can copy and just apply. In the past, after 1950s, there was a model called a tastic model. Here you can see in the figure one. It was successful model during the Cold War. And a success example is the Dane Soviet Union space supremacy. They sent human being before the US. The second is 
here you can see in the figure two, the Lysette's fair model, where there are separate institutional spheres with strong borders dividing them. But both of these are outdated now. Here I have a Nigerian model presented by the Nigerian science minister, who is also a professor of mathematics, I guess, very recently. The three entities, government, industry, and the university, which you can see here, are visibly seen here with equal ranking. This is based on the Swedish model developed by Ekowich and Lederstroff some 20 years ago. Here they have four types of organizations, as you can see in this picture. One is, uh, of course, government or the state. The other is academia and then the industry. And then there is a trilateral networks and hybrid organizations. Quite interesting, isn't it? The objective of this model is to realize an innovative environment consisting of university spin-off forms, trilateral initiatives for knowledge-based economic development, and strategic alliances among firms, that is private firms, government laboratories, and academic research groups. So this is what they call triple helix. As you know, triple helix is a biological metaphor, like DNA, RNA, something like that, you know it. Therefore, being a biological metaphor, a triple helix is not expected to be stable. The arrangements are often encouraged, but not controlled by the government. Please note the word. Whether through new rules of the game, the government do not direct or indirect influence through direct or indirect financial assistance or through any act or foundations or in our case, the council like a UGC because these founders and UGCs are just the postmaster, not to influence actually, to facilitate. A triple helix configuration looks clumsy, I know, you can see the picture here, very clumsy, looks very, very complicated. In fact, they are not synchronized a priori. They generate puzzles for the participants like you and me, Analyzed analysts like you and me, and policymakers to solve. So that was a theoretical perspective of policy implementation for technology development, innovation, whatever you can say. We may discuss it for long in a different and separate session. Let me now put my view on the implementation modality of Nepal's national science, technology, and innovation policy. A policy is often more of a hypothesis. Implementation converts a policy into an action program. In the present STI policy, there are five objectives, 29 strategies, and 50 executing policies, which are in fact the projects. It appears a big figure, I know. If I were there in the shoes of the implementing agency, this is what, or this is how I would do. Here you can see. For the implementation purpose, I would group them into 11 parts. As you can see here, infrastructure and legal framework, human resources and capacity building, finance and funding, fundamental cutting edge science, research and development, product and markets, innovation and incubation, education, training and curriculum, nine, awareness and public understanding, 10, cooperation and collaboration, and finally, documentation, monitoring and plan. So among these 11, what I would do is I will separate their works. I will divide the responsibilities. Like for the academia, and research organization two, four, and nine. For the government, that is federal, 
province and municipality one and 11. For industries and enterprises, five and six. And what about the others? The others they will share. For example, seven will be shared by academia and industries. The eight will be shared by academia and government. And the three will be shared by the government and industries. And the 10 will be shared by all these three. So this, what I would say, as a simplistic model that I think, because I like simplicity in science. As I mentioned earlier, we had a series of consultation meetings, interviews, interactions, almost on every occasion. The first thing we encountered was a question, will this policy be implemented? I was not sure, still I'm not sure if those question makers had gone through the Semine work by Aaron Bildavsky, why planning fails in Nepal. I'm not sure whether they have gone through it. Published in 1972, why planning fails in Nepal. Published in 1972, the paper has planning in Nepal. The paper has stated, let me uh, read out, Planning in Nepal has little to do with anything that happens in that country. Planned targets are not met. Planned expenditures are met, not met. The paper has explored the reasons for the failure. One, insufficient information. Two, few and poor project proposals. Three, inability to program foreign aid. Four, opposition of the finance ministry. Five, severely limited capacity to administer development. And the author has also specially mentioned the tortuous release of fund. Tortuous relief of funds. I let you make a judgment if the situation is still prevailing. Vildavsky visited Nepal back in 1971. He was associated with Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. I know some of the uh, the presenters here are from that university. He interviewed 29 personnel, including the Secretary of Finance. Dr. Guzu, Secretary we have uh, others. five minutes. Um... I'm enough, I'm enough, I will do it within three minutes. Members of Planning Commission. So in the next write-up published in 1973, Wildavsky has the title, if planning is everything, maybe it's nothing. So we have this national SDA policy. Time will tell you if it is everything or nothing. The world is passing through the perils of COVID-19 pandemic and Nepal is never an exception. Not only the health sector, but all through development pillars, society, economy, and environment have been shaken. Before these pillars are uprooted, Please move ahead, not fighting against Corona, but along with Corona. Science knows Corona better than anybody else, better than anything else. A belief in science is the only solution to today's paranoia and looming impacts on poverty levels. The rest of my opinion is in the abstract. Nepal's science policy implementation no wet at a crossroad. You might have read it already, so I skip it. I value your time. Let me just repeat at this juncture of pain and privilege that science, we need science, more science, and still more science. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Uh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Guzu, uh, for your uh, prolific remarks. And it's a really illuminating presentations. And, uh, and we actually, we are right, you know, finding you uh, as a keynote speaker um, for today's uh, session. And uh, particularly, I have never seen and heard this uh, triple helix structure before. Um, and also uh, the Venn diagram you have presented uh, is very explicit and uh, well articulated one. And uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Actually, you know, there is in Nepal, there is a saying that, uh, you know, the policy is good, but it failed. But I would argue, you know, if the policy is failed, how 
can we say it is good, right? So the, the testament of any policy is based on the implementation. So, um, yeah, and I completely agree with Dr. Buzu that, you know, we, he is, and all of us are awaiting, you know, how this new uh, science, uh, technology, and innovation policy will be implemented in Nepal. So, um, thank you everyone for listening. And as uh, uh, um, I said before, we have two other invited speakers, and um, uh, I already mentioned that there is a small trend, you know, like uh, Nepalese scientists go abroad and get training and experience from abroad and return back to home and either join already established government organization like NAS or they form their own startup uh, like Kayash. And we have two wonderful young um, invited speakers. Um, and one is uh, chosen from uh, the government institutions like NAS and another from the private uh, startup like Kayash. So, um, I would like to invite uh, our first uh, invited speaker, Dr. Ramchandra Paudia. Actually, he's uh, my classmate, um, and I'm very glad to have him here. And Dr. Ramchandra Paudia is a senior scientific officer at the National Academy of Science and Technology, NAS, and he, um, you know, has been working. Uh, in the various issues, uh, particularly focus on the Himalayan region. And his landmark work is the conservation genetics of the three species of yew, uh, Texas, I think, uh, distributed along the Hindukus Himalayan region. He has published more than 15 research articles um, and he is trained in molecular phylogeny and, um, and also in DNA barcoding, conservation genetics, Himalayan biogeography, biodiversity assessment, sustainable utilization, and value addition of non-timber forest product is the primary area of his research. And he has received our Darwin Initiatives and Third World Academy Awards recently. So I'd like to invite Dr. Ramchandra Podil uh, to deliver an invited speech. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Let me share my uh, slide. I think I do have problem with my camera. So, uh, shall I start? Yes, absolutely. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dostro uh, NRNA Global Knowledge Convention Ma Bibin Nestan Vata. Uh, online mark for Jordan on a Sampuna Adani Abahman Wah Pratima Harding Naman Gardachu, respected chairperson, the session uh, coordinates, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, this is Ramchandra Paudial uh, working in Nepal Academy of Science and Technology. In this presentation, I will focus on challenges on government organization to implement STI policy. Uh, 2019, I will uh, try to present. Uh, our situation uh, objectively as possible. Uh, we are uh, at an initial phase of implementation of the, uh, the policy. The concerned ministry, Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, Technology is carrying out different activities to implement this policy. Uh, policy implementation committee uh, formed by ministry have prepared action plans on seven different thematic areas. You can see uh, these uh, thematic areas on the screen. Since a majority of these thematic areas uh, have been prepared through uh, an active involvement of young, energetic, and dynamic group of experts, uh, these action plans would address aspiration of all kinds of you know, people and stakeholders. That is uh, our hope. Uh, the, those action plans uh, were pre -pre presented during the Eighth Science Day. Uh, now let us uh, move to the hurdle in school education. Uh, for STI development, we have to provide quality education to children of all uh, social classes and economic classes living in different uh, parts of the country. 
we have to enrich our uh, classes with sufficient teaching uh, um, materials, use multimedia while teaching and involve adequate hands-on activities, making learning uh, fun for students. Organizing science exhibitions will encourage more students to participate on innovations. In addition, uh, we have to attract young talents. This is a challenge in teaching profession because they are more likely to adopt uh, eff effective teaching methods using available new techniques. And regarding university education, although our existing university, universities are producing talent students, who regularly get admission in the top university of developed countries. Our uh, faculty infrastructure are still uh, very poor. There are lack of research and grants and fellowships for faculties and students to conduct scientific researches. Uh, we do not have you know, multidisciplinary lab where students can design, perform experiments, test their hypothesis on uh, you know, country's need and priorities students and faculties should have a collaboration with international universities for experience sharing for exposure and updates and we should provide sufficient opportunities to do phd and postdocs for students which is lacking talent graduates should be uh, uh, recruited in existing research organizations and probably incubation fund will encourage graduates to start their own business. Uh, in case of research organization or departments uh, under governments, they also have a similar problem. They lack research funds and skilled manpower, despite having empty positions. Sometimes they do have Darwandi as well. And due to lack of educated research culture, the research activities of the organization are not productive as expected. And these organization departments have defined objectives, you know, guided by acts and regulation. They do have acts and regulation. And these organizations are in operation for many years, like 15, some 20, some 30, 35 years. But why we do not have tangible outputs from research and innovation activities conducted by these organizations? So we should uh, think it very, you know, seriously. There are no faults. In fact, there are no faults in organization themselves. There is no problem with the structure. The problems are with the team who execute, you know, scientific activities using available resources and working modalities they adopt. That is a problem, it seems. And STI policy should have a clear roadmap to revive and restructure such organization similarly these needs to be you know there needs to be the clarity on autonomy of the institutes research institutes and we should understand why research institutes need autonomy I will, I will talk about this in my coming slides and now let's briefly assess the working modality adopted by research organization organization lack long-term mid-term short-term research goals and priorities Management is not capable of mobilizing limited available resources and they do not have you know, database of past activities, their research, because past activities should be leveraged in the new programs, which is not happening. And there, this is attributed to frequent change in leadership you know, in these organizations. And sometimes they don't have right person uh, for the right position, like department head, unit head, lab head, or program head. You know, there should be who should have you know, expertise in the related subject matter. It should be, it is very important. And staffs, normally staffs are transferred to different departments or units, sometimes different district as well. They visit, they go there and there they, they, they don't have opportunity to continue the research which, in which they were involved for several years. So their previous research activity would not be productive because they can't continue and the the next assignment they get and their activity would not be effective because, because they don't have expertise on that so this is the main reason on reduced capacity and lack of motivation towards scientific and innovation innovative activities among staffs situation in uh, is slightly different in in the organization uh, they get political leadership in fact, political, political leadership has power and opportunity to make remarkable changes in the organized institutes. However, 
if they are happy in routine works rather to you know focus on the restructuring then then the organization lag behind to define its priorities and goals organization will give emphasis and such organization are giving uh, emphasis toward popularization activities rather you know rather to conduct wet lab research which can establish research culture in the organization and changes in leadership in such organization and and the focus of the leadership also cause negative in, impact on the existing manpower and their exist um, their expertise as well so in addition to discrepancies in you know working modalities or execution of activities other barriers are related with management you know like procurement system we adopt procurement system to procure equipment reagents and consumables according to this system the bidder who propose lowest cost will supply the equipment and such equipments will have you know similar definitely similar specification but are less standard and low in quality and they need these equipments needs regular maintenance for proper functioning thus government organization are full of less equipment you know um, equ uh, less efficient equipment so they are from, are now as dumping sites so and nobody wants to take risk and go for standard high quality tested equipments another most frustrating scenario in the organization is that the management seems to be happy for procuring equipments but they do not give serious attention concern for regular operation of those equipments sometimes some equipments end up on the junk without even unboxing them similarly another management hurdle is the economic procedure and regulation that we adopt according to this procedure scientific activities can be conducted for cannot be conducted for more than 7 days and the allowance for field trip is is very low if you want to have field visits for more than 7 days then your allowance will be sliced down to 40 to 60% actually this system is to regulate actually to to on uh, for unnecessary trip during administrative undertaking but such system is not conducive for research activities because of very low field allowance and short time there is limited time collection of standard uh, statistically significant and primary primary data is not possible and that's why most of the government researches are entirely dependent on foreign aid if there is foreign aid and they collect primary data if there is no foreign aid data revision and update is not possible that's what happening another management issue is the uh, civil service rule itself every year the the organizations head or person in charge evaluate the performance of staff which is important for promotion and award you can see the form here this form do not have any fields and any you know mechanism to fill the achievement of the research like articles books research innovation there is no fields to fill in on this form and under the same civil uh, service rules there is a defined pathway for promotion where research articles books innovation are hardly evaluated and whether you publish in have five paper, minutes okay Left. or in local newspaper that doesn't make any difference specialization and phd have negligible weightage during promotion as well and phd or specialization is not necessary to lead uh, organization or shorten post similar period of service is the important parameter irrespective of his or her scientific capabilities person who can pass the exam of public service commission is competent for any position in on in research organization a diploma or master degree holder can head multidisciplinary research centers no need to be specialized in the field so there is no you know concern regarding the expertise so in such situation how we can recruit talent both young and old faculties research scholars working in developed countries in our research institutions and academies how we can connect nasa to multidisciplinary lab existing at nast narc and other departments no there is there is so there is but unfortunately there is light of hope recently uh, in recent years tu has taken initiatives and started to recruit talent uh, from abroad 
And another frustrating part is the dominance of administration over scientific activities. Scientific activities and research culture will come in complete halt when leadership and administrator staff do not understand the importance of wet lab research. This is the problem. They cannot see difference between procuring vehicle or painting building. I'm procuring sophisticated equipment, high quality reagents. And such people are less interested to allocate money for research and functioning of equipment that have been purchased. And it is difficult to justify the necessity of extra days for the scientists, but extra days for collecting more and good quality sample if they don't understand. And research paper and innovations are always undermined by such in your practice when such culture persists in the organization. And the, they want scientists grow like you know pumpkin on the branches of tree within one year or if the leader is there for a few years then he's hard tenure he want to see that sort of product so how sti policy can improve such situation prevalent in research organization we should you know discuss this seriously it is up to the concerned authorities whether to blame organization the structure and look for possibility by opening new con centers, universities, or start sincere and productive effort to revive and restructuring of existing research organization where nationally and internationally trained manpower can work independently and private organization can also work together for the development of STI in Nepal. So in conclusion, STI activities will be productive in government organization if working modalities in such organization and our service systems are you know, changed in its favor, like procurement system, economy regulation, recruitment of specialized talent, give a like, first class position for faculties, research scholars uh, who work in the world class universities. And another is autonomy is necessary for overall management of the organization. But, but right person is the must for these organization, autonomous organization who will lead this organization. And since there are several areas have been incorporated in the policy, cross-cutting issues are there, the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology should enhance its own capacity to coordinate you know, related ministries for any effective implementation. And definitely another is the investment of research should be increased. And last but not least, ministries should act seriously for revival and restructuring of existing institutes rather than establishing new centers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paudel, um, uh, for your interesting talk. And those who have joined recently, late uh, to this uh, session, uh, you are in the third plenary session on science, technology, and innovation policy implementation of the second NRN Global Conventions. So uh, Ram Chandra Paudel has highlighted, you know, several hurdles uh, that he uh, has faced. Um, and uh, in the government institutions, and some of them are structural, some of them are systemic, and some of them are managerial. And despite these hurdles, and these people are uh, able to overcome these hurdles and uh, uh, do some good work in Nepal. And uh, he also highlighted there has been some changes happening in Nepal. Uh, more recently, you know, Trujan University has started, um, you know, recruiting faculties. Um, uh, based on the research excellence and uh, and so those uh, changes um, are happening not only in the university but also outside the universities so one of that change you can see is you know prolific growth of new uh, startup or institutions research institutions from private sectors and we have uh, in today's uh, plenary session a speaker um, dr basantagiri uh, from at such institutions. So Dr. Basantagiri uh, received a bachelor's degree and master's degree in chemistry from Tribhuvan University, uh, Nepal. Uh, 
and he also got the second master's degree from the Oregon State University, US, and he completed his PhD from the University of Wyoming, uh, USA, and he co-founded uh, a research center called Kathmandu Institute of Applied Sciences, KIAS, and he works there as a senior scientist, and he re his research interest includes a development of new technologies appropriate in resource-limited settings like Nepal, um, and uh, he has um, uh, several years of experience in teaching, particularly for undergraduate and graduate students, both in Nepal and the US. And he has authored several uh, uh, research articles and two books. Actually, Dr. Giri is one of the motivations for all the diaspora scientists who has been working abroad and thinking to come back to Nepal because he has founded uh, excellent institutions and um, shown that there is a possibility doing good science uh, working in the limited resource condition like Nepal. And more recently, the papers or the research, uh, his institutions and him um, were cited um, by WHO in the context of COVID. So without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Giri uh, Basanta. Now, uh, floor thank, you. thank you, Uttamji, for the nice introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the second NRN Global Knowledge Con uh, Convention Organizing Committee and the uh, coordinators of this plenary session for inviting me. Uh, dear uh, chair of this session, uh, so in this presentation, I will uh, share my experience of establishing a non-governmental research organization in Nepal and running it for several years. Um, I also share the story of similar other organizations functioning in Nepal. Two previous speakers uh, nicely uh, talked about the history of bringing the STI policy uh, in Nepal, and then uh, Ramchandra uh, Paulilji uh, explained the challenges of running a research, uh, government research organizations. Uh, so my slides are in uh, English, but I will be uh, moving back and forth in both in English and Nepali, because we are talking about STI policy um, in Nepal. Uh, as uh, Ramchandra ji rightly pointed out, uh, a list of uh, problems. Uh, some of the problems we also share with them, uh, and but we have some unique problems uh, that government research organizations do not have to face. Um, among many problems, I will focus on two important issues, uh, and then uh, also briefly uh, touch upon other um, a few issues. So when we look at the uh, research publications, uh, uh, obviously the contribution from universities is uh, dominating. And also there are some government uh, agencies and departments. Uh, they are also uh, contributing to research and some hospitals, uh, even teaching hospitals, um, NGOs and INGOs, nonprofit um, companies. And there are a few uh, research-based organizations who are actively involved in research innovation um, in Nepal. Among those research-based organizations uh, is the Kathmandu Institute of Applied Sciences. Uh, this is a science, we focus mostly on science, multidisciplinary science and research-focused institution. Uh, we established this uh, institution in, back in 2014 um, by a group of uh, our colleagues uh, who were uh, trained and educated in abroad, uh, come back, came back to Nepal, and then uh, wanted to have a, a nice research institution. But it is registered as a non-government organization. Uh, currently, we have about 20 uh, to 25 um, workforce, including four full-time PhD scientists and other uh, research associates and research assistants. Uh, we have been uh, very active um, in our work for past only four years. 
uh, Kathmandu Institute of Applied Sciences uh, uh, scientists or uh, researchers in this institute um, do a lot of uh, cover a lot of areas, including you know environmental science, uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, wildlife, human conflict, uh, to you know uh, using remote sensing uh, to look at the drought over the South Asia region and uh, developing low cost analytical technologies uh, to screen the quality of you know even drugs, water, food. We also work on uh, science policy issues, conservation policy issues, governance planning, and um, we have been also involved in citizen science projects. Just to highlight, take the, this opportunity and uh, I want to highlight uh, the work of my research group. We focus on developing low cost technologies that are particularly appropriate for resource limited settings. Um, so our um, technologies are applicable in drug, work, drug quality screening, both allopathic and herbal drugs. Uh, also in water quality screening, uh, we have been working on uh, air quality monitoring issues, uh, food quality, for example, developing a paper-based analytical device for uh, measuring the pesticide residues on food and vegetables. Uh, we have also developed paper-based device uh, for uh, some clinical applications uh, uh, particularly urine and blood samples uh, for test, uh, testing some um, uh, target analytes. And basically uh, we uh, work on developing paper microfluidics as you see in the left lower corner and then combine that with the smartphone technology to read the signal on the paper device, analyze the signal and report the result to the user. Just to highlight recent, our recent um, works, on your left you see uh, the um, the work on the filtering efficiency of face masks published last year uh, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Bhanu Nupane from uh, Tripubani University. Uh, this work actually because of COVID uh, got quite a bit of uh, attention. It has been uh, cited or featured in more than 100 uh, uh, newspapers, including USA Today and um, Scientific American. And one policy document by the WHO in its uh, guideline for uh, personal protective equipment, uh, our paper has been cited. Uh, the left one, uh, the paper uh, on the smartphone microscope for uh, detecting cryptosporidium and GRDA has been published in uh, PLUS Neglected Tropical Disease. And uh, actually Nepali uh, media also uh, featured this uh, paper, uh, for example, in Nepal cover and also in Kanti. So we are, we are quite very happy about um, about, about this. So we, we think that we have been um, doing uh, good science um, in Nepal. Um, and we are not the only institutions, uh, especially I'm talking about the non-governmental institutions. There are quite a few other um, institutions and we have a, a loose network of uh, our alliance of these institutions known as the Nepal Research uh, Alliance. And all of these uh, institutions are uh, doing pretty well. Uh, they are uh, doing um, internationally rec recognized uh, world-class research and world-class science. But if you are planning to establish a non-governmental research organization in Nepal, so I will walk you through the procedure. Um, uh, basically, there are two options. The first option, you have to register as a NGO at the district administration office, or you can also register as a, at the office of the company registrar. Uh, most of our colleagues have registered as a non-profit distributed company. And I'll uh, share my experience um, of registering, uh, renewing every year and taking approvals uh, for uh, organization uh, like Kayas, which is registered as a NGO. So we have to go to the ward office get all the documents, uh, get recommendation from our office, and then bring that package to the municipality office and get their recommendation and go to a district coordination committee these days. And then finally go to the district administration office uh, for registration. We also have to get registered at the inland revenue office for tax purposes. And finally, the social welfare council which oversees our activities. And 
you have to do this uh, every year uh, during the renewable process. If you are lucky enough and you have a good network uh, of people in these offices, uh, you can finish it maybe in a couple of weeks. Otherwise, it takes uh, months. Uh, we also need to get approval for our projects, especially those are funded by international funding agencies from the Social Welfare Council. Uh, and we repeat the same pro procedure. Go to War Office, um, submit all the project documents uh, and the institutional document, get recommendation from the War Office, go to municipality, do the same thing, and then finally go to the Social uh, Welfare Council uh, for the approval. Uh, let me share you uh, one of my uh, own experience. Uh, we got, uh, two years ago, we got <coughs> a funding uh, from National Academy of uh, Science, Engineering, and Medicine from the US. Uh, because it is international funding, we, we needed to get approval from the SWC. So we submitted our documents after several weeks of, you know, uh, here and there to the Social Welfare Council. Uh, and then uh, Social Welfare Council uh, wanted to get a, um, a suggestion, uh, a RAI from uh, two ministries, Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperative that time, Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Science and Technology that time. Now it's uh, Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. So the Ministry of Agriculture, the ministry itself could not a give rai. So it uh, sent our documents to the Department of Agriculture, another uh, office, uh, and then Department of, Department of Agriculture uh, sent our file to the uh, Plant Protection Directorate. And Plant, Plant Protection uh, Directorate uh, finally um, um, recommended our project. It's a good project. It should be implemented. So, and that cycle again repeated. It went back to the DO, Department of Agriculture and then the Ministry. And um, finally, we got letters from both ministries and submitted to Social Welfare Council. And uh, we were able to get the approval, but it took four months. And that's a long time. Uh, Dr. Giri, you have five minutes left. All right. So the, basically what I'm trying to say here is SWC is not the appropriate agency to uh, oversee and regulate the non-governmental research organizations. It doesn't have the capacity to evaluate and monitor our work. So that's the number one problem. There is a lack of legal framework and government agency. So what we have been arguing or lobbying is and the second, uh, the biggest challenge is the funding. I think all of us know uh, Nepal is very negligible on research and development. And there are a few uh, funding agencies, example, UGC, which funds only to university faculty and uh, students, and NAST, and a few other organizations. If you look at the non-governmental research organizations, they bring actually millions of dollars of research funding in Nepal every year. And then it's not sustainable. So we need a research uh, uh, a funding agency. So we have been arguing or lobbying for the national establishment of the national funding agency, something like the National Science Foundation uh, in the US. Uh, uh, it can uh, cover, the national uh, funding agency can cover, you know, uh, governmental and both non-governmental organizations, individual and in institutional uh, research grants. Uh, I argue for uh, it should give grants for both uh, profit-making and non-profit-making institutions and cover all areas um, of research, including esteem, social science, medicines, and others. And uh, if we increase the current spending of about 0.3% uh, of our GDP by 25% annually, we could reach actually 2% of uh, G, uh, GDP in research and development by next 10 years. Uh, we have suggested these, these numbers uh, in various platforms. Other challenges, 
Actually, if you, are, if you, you, you may be surprised, the lab supplies, some specific reagents are about 200 to 300 more expensive in Nepal than in the US, so it's very costly. There is um, issues of patenting our uh, technologies. Nepal has not signed, I believe, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, uh, which is hindering um, a lot of uh, our uh, researchers. And this lack of human resources, highly skilled human resources are hard to find. And there is a lack of the culture of collaboration. That's partly due to the government policies. Udharan uh, Gulagi, if we bring a big funding, a multinational collaborative research funding in Nepal, uh, having partners in other countries, you cannot actually pay uh, your partners in other countries. That that's, uh, hinders collaboration. So uh, Bhujusra talked about this uh, STI policy, 2019. Uh, your policy is uh, 2061. policy. It talks about a lot of things, you know, funding, uh, government policies, political stability, and all these things. Uh, and it, it also talks about establishing a separate mechanism for non-governmental research organizations. Uh, we are still uh, to see how it um, is implemented. Amle bhanne gare ki jasto anushandhan gare saanstha avale sammandhine, sammadhan gare, saule dhine, neeman gare, ispasha niti kanunra nikaya ko chai gathan uncha ki unna yo policy antra gat teo chai herna paaki chai. Testi gara yo policy li chai funding ko pani kura gare ko chai. Course Kodagari Kuragari Kosa, Policy Ago Egg Borsa Boysiko. I think you do take Kama Rizan, I'll summon Boyko China, side K Homer Koru this Hola. Interesting Kurakes Havane, you policy go print version Matsain. I'm the GDP go egg percent research and development ma Purune, Banera Leke with you, Tarotela saying your online digital version go copy Matsain Hataiko Raisa of a SLK Sankat Utpana Goribosa. You STI policy, ma, family, banana kura, ami pani individual group ma, ra nesa Nepal Research Alliance ko taraf baata, pani family dhari salla sujha baru diye kathiyo, kai salla sujha baru ay kathiyo, na dhari kura ma, kai kura ma, ami zain, amro asaw mati pani dhari kosa. Tio madhe uta asaw mati zain, yo jun parishat ko gathan gariye kosa, yo parishat ko gathan jun structure se structure le zain kam garna sab dena banne yo. Is to kina banana ko banana? You want the Agadi in 2061, Pandra Bosha Agadi Banako policy weapon, yes, the instructs at you. Tertio, Matu committee go to Polisot go to Ekpatakoni Boytak Nabasigana, Malay Zankari Bayonza, two committees, two policies and Sidir and Naya policy. I, Tarakushiko Kura Kesavani, Malatha Bayonza, Oiliko, your policy undergot Polisot go to Boytak Bossi, Boytak Bossera, especially K Kamar, got this hub and Mrs. Sunam Ayagota. So hopefully. Uh, you only go STI policy lays a uh, policy implement Hunza, uh, Rupa Navabin Kaneke, partly weapon implement Hunza, Hola, Bani, uh, Hamila Asasa, Ramil Agi Utago, do the important issues or address Gartha, Bani Asasa, Editus of Bayana Mandekis, I mean Gothmatri Gartha, Cam Gordon, Cam Nagari Pesita, Kosin in Nepal, and some did the Hunsara, some did the Hunokalagi, I'm a research sayo, innovation sayo, invention Gornu Pari, or two inventions in Bakuma Hudena. This could like a hamlet policy science, policy ISEQ, Abutala implementation Gorera, Ramro Ramro institution or Bonon Porio, and this was Ramro Kamgoni Mansola, Nepal and Bossera, Kamgoni, Batabron Bonon Porio, and this was funding Gosai, Ramro Bevasta Porio, Bevasta Gorno Porio, Bane Bande, near a presentation. I conclude Gorsu. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer in later. Thank you, Dr. Giri. Um, so, actually, we are on track of time, and um, he has highlighted several hurdles uh, that uh, the private uh, institutions uh, are facing in Nepal. Uh, some are directly linked uh, to the implementation of STI policy, and we have, luckily, um, here, uh, the secretary from the Education, Science, and Technology Ministry, uh, so hope in his tenure, uh, we have uh, been able to solve, we'll be able to solve these issues um, and that will ease, um, uh, you know, doing research in Nepal. Actually, you know, while uh, Dr. Giri was presenting uh, his uh, presentation and I was looking, you know, how many research institutions in Nepal are indexed in Nature Index. And what I have found, because <clears throat> I strongly believe um, you know, there is a huge um, potential and also 
the possibility of doing science outside you know government settings and when the nepal is prosperous country and we will have when our university is like you know harbor yell or kind of university like that and then our institutions like gaias will be something like brookings or uh, terry or something like that so we need those type of locally led institutions in nepal more and more so and uh, I just want to highlight, you know, I was looking when Dr. Giri was uh, giving his talk and I was looking in Nature Index, how many institutions in Nepal were indexed in that list. And what I found was, uh, it was just arbitrarily and our institutions, Global Institute for Interdisciplinary Studies, which he cited in his slide, was indexed there. So you can see, you know, the, the environment, um, is there and we need to do the credible research and we need to do the credible science and the government policies should be facilitating uh, the research. So hopefully, you know, in his concluding remarks, Dr. Sanjay Sarma, the Secretary uh, for the Education and Sci Education Science and Technology Ministry uh, will bring the hope for all of us I would like to invite, with a, without further delay, uh, Dr. Sanjay Sarma uh, for his uh, concluding remarks. Dr. Sarma. <clears throat> uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Are you able to hear? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I suppose we still have we still have panelists uh, to to uh, uh, to speak. Uh, Andy. <laughs> Dr. Dungel, I think uh, you, you're supposed to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, right? yeah. It'll okay. be better to wrap up the session with your concluding remarks at the end. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Srestha, I think baton is passed on to me. Uh, may I proceed? Uh, with the permission of the... Yeah, session. Please. Uh, uh, respected session chair, mm. Distinguished uh, speakers, panelists, uh, other participants. Fortunately, we have uh, the cons uh, chair also, uh, you know, in our session today, Dr. Sarma, Hemra Sarma, uh, who's the general secretary of the NRNA, uh, and uh, all the participants from across the globe who are watching us live on Facebook. So everybody, uh, once again, on behalf of the uh, session coordinator want to humbly welcome you in this plenary session. Uh, before I proceed further, because we are running short of time though, uh, this is a network platform also, therefore I must say something on how this session was structured. Uh, for your kind information, in our session altogether, including session chair, we have uh, two physicists by basic, you know, uh, two, four biologists, and uh, one magician who's the champion of STEM education as well. One architect uh, uh, turned urban planner, and uh, session chair himself is civil and environment engineer. So you can easily sense the inclusiveness of this session. And now, without further ado, I want to enter to the uh, introduction of our panelist, the first and foremost, Dr. Ambika Adhikari. Uh, his uh, principal Anna, uh, at the city of Temp in Arizona, uh, USA. Uh, he is a research uh, professor of urbaning, associate professor. Back in Nepal, he was associate professor at the Institute of Engineering, Truven University. Uh, he was also uh, in the high profile position of country representative of IUCN. And his uh, qualification, he, he did his master's in urban planning from the University of Hawaii, PhD from Harvard University, and he was a fellow of uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, commonly known as MIT. And he has led several projects as coordinators, PI, produced, uh, he has authored the book, the you know, book chapters, different research articles, so what else? So he, he is 
the towering personality in the NRNA uh, itself uh, as an advisor. Next uh, star of the panel is Dr. Uh, Binil Ariel. I'm proud to uh, call my as sometime fellow colleague when we're doing masters together. Uh, he is currently heading the Central Department of Physics at Turbunity for the second time. Uh, and he's a senator, he's a member of different committees. He did his uh, MSc in physics from TU uh, and PhD from Innsbruck uh, University in Austria. And he is uh, decorated with Mahendra Vidya uh, as a topper of MSc physics of his time. And he also received the award, TWAS award uh, through NAST. Our next panelist is uh, Professor Dr. Chandra Lintel. Uh, he is a professor of uh, mathematics education at Kathmandu University and currently is affiliated to the ESTEAM uh, education department um, in the School of Education. He did MSc with distinction from TU, PhD with first commendation uh, from Australian University. And uh, he has also received a Young uh, Scientist Award and uh, several papers, book are in credit, and he is also editor of several journals. Uh, so uh, th that's all about him uh, in brief. Now, next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Anindita Badra. Actually, uh, she is a biologist, biologist by training. Uh, she takes care of the trade, has done a lot of research on it. And currently, she is the co-chair of Global Young uh, Scientist Academy. And he founded 15 years back, she founded the Indian uh, Young Scientist Academy. Uh, and um, she, she is a great uh, advocate of the animals, actually. Uh, next, we have is the lady, Dr. Prati Pandey. Uh, she is the founder uh, and CEO of East Technology and Harveda Botanica. Uh, she is a researcher, come entrepreneur. Uh, she has uh, uh, actually um, been working in the field of value addition of the medicinal and aromatic plants of Nepal, basically. Uh, and uh, she is the board of trustees of uh, newly formed uh, Gandaki University, Provincial University. And uh, she has received the prestigious fellowship, UNESCO, OWSD, early career lip, uh, very recently. And in 2019, she was uh, awarded with NAST Novel uh, S&T Award. She has done master's and PhD from Northwestern University of United States. So this is uh, the brief introduction of our panelists. So I welcome uh, all the panelists uh, in this session. So because running short of time, I don't find you with uh, uh, my questions in the beginning. So may I uh, request all of you turn by turn, starting from uh, Dr. Ambika Adhikari, sir, uh, who, you know, give your free opinion on how you could contribute or how you could suggest to make national STI policy uh, implementation in Nepal uh, quite a smooth uh, and easy. so I have a free you know opinion from you sir Ambika sir Florence Thank and you. I expect within four minutes uh, uh, you you very uh, you know clearly put forward your opinion. Thank you so much Dr. Dungil. Thank you so much Dr. Dungil, Dr. Svesta and Dr. Sarma. This is it's a privilege to be part of this really intellectual panel. Um, I did listen to the three great presentations that were made today. Um, and it's so good to see many familiar faces like the Dr. Buzu. I also actually saw Dr. Badraman Tulalaji long time ago. I remember him from Dharan when the Applied Science and Technology <clears throat> Institute was started. Um, we kind of talk about, uh, and, and when Do Dr. Buzu spoke about some of the planning like Aaron Dhaldivasti, that also reminded me of my days as a student in planners. There were many interesting things. 
Uh, lots of good points came. I, when uh, Dr. Giri was talking about how tedious it is to get renewal of some of the documentation in Nepal, I was reminded of two quotations that I had heard Dr. Zagadish Bhagavati talking about back in the old days in India prior to 1990s. So it was talked about by Indian professionals, so I can quote it quite safely because they've done They've come a long way, they've done quite a bit, but it, before the 90s, even the bureaucracy in India was not all the best. So one quotation was, the Indian state has the engine of a bullock cart, but the brakes of the Rolls Royce. And when Dr. Giri was talking about all the paperwork and documentation that you need to go through, the hassle that you need to go through just to get the registration, I got reminded of that. And then also, before the science and technology really took place in India, right now India is a world power in software technology, even in space technology and so on. Dr. Zagdish Bhagavati, again, economist at Columbia University, I was listening to one of his talks and he quoted one Indian national saying, the only part of the Indian car that was made prior to 1990 that made noise, that did not make noise, was the horn of the car. So, you know, countries go through a lot of problems when science and technology has to take root in the country. And I know compared to what we had in Nepal 20, 25 years ago, people like Dr. Dungail, Dr. Giri, Dr. Uttam Babu sister who's gone back to Nepal and established things. I think we've come a long way and I, that really gives us a hope. Now, the important thing is with the digital technologies, just like we are right now, across the time zones, across all the seven continents, the diaspora is growing in its size. We are almost 800,000 permanently settled diaspora in the developed world, in North America, Europe, and Oceania. And we can talk in real time, we can connect in real time, so it's not like previous to the digital technology, things are very difficult. So we can basically just like the World Wide Web, I think the brains are also now connected. We can be in Joomla or you can be in Phoenix, Arizona, and you could still access the same Google. You can still access the same Zoom technology. So I think this really gives us a really good boost to, to work on the scientific field. Now, the science and technology, I remember my days in IEC doing the intermediate of science in Biratnagar, Moran College, you know, we had no electricity in the hostel that I lived. I came from Dharan in Bhospur, no electricity. And we used to study in physics, the current electricity and, and static electricity. So a lot of things were abstract. I had not seen how electricity actually worked, but we used to study it and try to make sense of it. It was difficult. I think in our developing, developing country, a lot of that abstraction sometimes doesn't give us the experiential learning. Now Nepal has come a long way, and I think the fields of the science, technology, engineering, and, and, and medicine, I think we have a lot of things that are happening, and we can really push the type of education that is more experiential, that's more hands-on, that works in the lab. And in Nepal, I know that we also had lots of these superstitions and our cultural inertia that science and technology is a little different than new things. And I think those barriers are being broken. And as they say, whether you believe in it or not, the laws of gravity is applied to everyone. So science and technology is something whether even if you have superstitious belief, science and technology will actually work. If you jump, you'll fall down. And with those kind of things, I think the educational investment that Dr. Buzu talked about, the startups that uh, we heard from Dr. Podil and uh, Dr. Giri, I think those are the elements that really push us forward in science and technology. I think we have uh, come a long way, a long way to go, but thank you so much for, your, for this opportunity. Dr. Tangir, back to you. Thank you, sir, uh, for your full and encouraging words. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to you again, uh, final round. So there's the first round going on. So uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Binil Arial, I think uh, the same, same applies to you as well. Please uh, express your uh, opinion how we could uh, smoothly implement the current STI uh, policy in Nepal. 
because you have uh, been a leader of a successful leader of the department uh, of physics in the Tiruman University. Please, please uh, turn. Can you hear me? I, I think he was there in the beginning, but I don't see him uh, turning on. So should we move to the next? Uh, Professor Dr. Bal Chandra Nuitel from Kathmandu University. So because the science education, both policies have highlighted on STEAM education to be the integral of the education system of Nepal and you are the champion of STEAM education. Could you highlight yeah, you know, integrating that to the science policy as well. In addition of science policy, please. Unmute. Thank you, Dr. Dungyal, and thank you. Um, the presentations, uh, presenters, the the presentations were um, wonderful, excellent, and they um, tossed up on different dimensions of STI policy. Um, you know, I mean, you just mentioned uh, STEAM and uh, STI policy. I think uh, we cannot actually uh, make STI policy better without integrating it with education system. We need to actually conceive of the science and technology education from the perspective of improving our lives. So from that perspective, I think you know what uh, Dr. Adhikari just mentioned, more of experiential learning, we need more, more maker space pedagogy, and that has to be integrated with STI policy. For example, we are preparing curriculum. This is the time of curriculum revision. Revision This year is the year of curriculum revision. And we need to actually reflect um, uh, our vision into these curricula from grade one to grade 12. Um, I think, you know, if we are to reflect on our science, math, technology education, we call it STEAM, science, math, technology, engineering, and we also inserted arts and creative, you know, creative creativity and arts in there. So um, we need a cadre, and this cadre can be prepared, uh, can be better prepared if we have a better school education system. So for that, we need more, um, uh, shift from science as a body of knowledge to more science as an activity or science as a set of activities. So for that, we need maker space like uh, you know, schools should have not just science lab. Science lab is something old idea. Now we need maker space. We need pedagogy that actually engage learners as, um, as, as someone who produce solutions. Solutions very much uh, you know, helpful to um, address problems around their, their, their life world. So that is one of the departure we need in both policy, uh, in STI policy, and also connected that with education system. Um, one idea about science, you know, there are different forms of science education. One that we transmit information, one that engages students in practical learning, one that engages students in um, you know, social transformation. For example, science can be a vehicle for social transformation, but we need that kind of uh, educational process in the school system. If you are to reflect on the ongoing educational process around science, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, and so on and so forth, then uh, the, the dominant uh, system or dominant pedagogy, if I are to say, is more of transmission kind. It deals with information. So we need to actually make a clear departure in policy that the nature of science, nature of science and technology we are advocating, okay? So that, that is my concern. I think that is needed uh, until and unless we integrate with right type of education, I would call it right type of education. Uh, otherwise it would be difficult to actually uh, actually having uh, solutions driven, more innovation, invention driven science, uh, you know, in, in, in a school and university system. As far as, uh, you know, linkage between industry and university, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Buzo mentioned quite, you know, appropriately that the, the policy premise is, is quite fine. But how about the implementing agencies? How about our universities? We have 11, 12 universities. 
and their science and technology education, their engineering education. We need to see that, uh, we need to put that in context. For example, you know, if I'm not um, wrong, then the success rate of engineering uh, programs is around, you know, uh, 49 to 50 percent. The, fail, the, the wastage is there, the wastage is huge, those who come to science, engineering, and technology, you know, departments. So um, we, why that is happening? Because we, our, our educational systems around science and technology is very much driven by, you know, this rote memorization, rote learning, and uh, there is an absence, there is a huge absence of actually maker space maker space and you know more of uh, uh, experience in learning kind of paradigm so we need to shift towards uh, more uh, experiential uh, more uh, practical more solutions driven educational process throughout the education system and then we prepare appropriate career probably and then we prepare you know institutions we create institutions we prepare human resource for those institutions so that that's what i have to say as of now uh, thank you, Professor Nuitel, for wonderful remarks. Uh, I'll get back to you for the second round of uh, question. Uh, now I, I invite uh, Dr. Bhadra, Anandita Bhadra, for your insightful remarks. I don't know if she also seems to have been disconnected because she was there in the beginning. I don't see her. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pandey, are you there online? Yes, I'm here. Otherwise, you can take this opportunity as soon as they uh, come back, uh, they'll get the chance. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, namaste, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk here. Um, I feel very privileged. I was listening to everyone. Um, um, when I was in the US uh, five years ago, I was there for uh, a little bit more than a decade. And I always thought of coming back to Nepal and try to do something in the field of science and technology. Looking back and listening to the problems that I would hear from Nepal would be them versus us. Them is government and us is all of us, rest of us. And, uh, I mean, I, I still hear that sort of dialogue, um, uh, rightly so in some way, because I mean, government is our guardian, but also when I came back, I realized that, you know, we also have a lot of responsibility as us, uh, because there needs to be a critical mass that needs to come together to solve these problems and question the government, even the guardians when they are not going in the right direction. And that's, I guess, the new generation is doing that from home to office to even government. And this is a very good platform where we're able to talk like this and everyone is listening and you know, there is a lot of reception. So starting with uh, the STI policy implementation, I'm grateful to be part of the one of the uh, to be one of the coordinators to look at the R&D and innovation part of the STI policy, which I think is like one of the vastest and the heart of STI policy. And it's uh, it's it's been pretty daunting task to look at it holistically. Um, so I'll talk about some of that experience. And also when I came back, I decided um, to actually work in the junction of academia, government, and industry by becoming an entrepreneur myself, doing research on things that we can spin off into industries and products, and also working very closely with the government in impl uh, policy implementation process or policy design process. So with this, uh, looking at the science, technology, and innovation policy um, that has been recently um, distributed uh, it is very comprehensive like dr buzu uh, dr buzu uh, talked about and uh, so far all the speakers have talked about the gaps and i see that all those gaps are literally written out in the policy meaning like to solve the policy will then the policy solve it 
I'm not sure, but is it addressed in the policy document? It is, and that's exactly what the implementation policy uh, um, team is trying to do, where can we, as much as possible, make an implementation policy that, is, that has a long-term vision, but also have small wins, so that we can at least show some you know, uh, wins or progress so that it motivates us to move forward. So having said that, what are some of the shifts from previous policies? Uh, we're trying to make this policy adaptable, very flexible, because as we know, science and technology is moving so fast and the pace is so fast, we cannot predict what's going to happen in 10 years. If someone asked me, who do you want to become in 10 years? Uh, when I was in school, I could have said it maybe doctor or engineer, looking back, you know, I was wrong because the science and technology is moving so fast, you can't really predict that. So in the education side of things, what we're trying to do is, can we have scientific methodologies? And like uh, Dr. Luitel was saying, can we have things like experiential learning and maker space kind of thing where you can decide what you want to become in future, right? Uh, one of the biggest things that we talked about was about funding funding and having this foundation science council or foundation that looks after the regulations and guidelines of science and technology uh, part of things. And that's one of the main things in policy document where it has said that we need to establish science, technology, innovation council or foundation. Is, it that, is that gonna be done or not? You know, we'll know soon. We have NPC member who's looking after that uh, committee and he has to sort of present at the end to tell us how much money he's going to give and how we're going to coordinate among different uh, teams. There are seven subcommittees looking at seven different things from education to science, uh, R&D to uh, professional groups and things like that. I will highlight some of the things that each of the coordination committee is looking after, I guess. Uh, I can't really talk about everything. So one is establishment of uh, science foundation, mainly to look at funding and other regulations. Uh, another is we talk a lot about having incubation centers, research hubs, technology park. One thing we have said is in short term first, we need to have a database of what we have, what is functioning and what is not, identify the redundancies, and if we have councils, if we have academies, what are the work areas they should be fixed with? And you know, so have this guideline and criteria of how they should be working and also have a monitoring mechanism, almost like a grading system for each of these institutions. That's something we have proposed um, to sort of have an accountability mechanism and have like refreshing mechanism as precursors of you know, technology parks and other things that can build, but we need to have this data first. Uh, this is more of problem-driven uh, um, problem mechanism than solution-driven mechanism. Another is scientific methodology of teaching, scientific way uh, of thinking in classrooms. Not everyone wants to go into the field of science, but everyone should have those 21st century skills. Mostly scientists are trained for that, critical thinking, you know, uh, anal analytical thinking and things like that. So, you know, everyone could have that. Another, uh, I am also affected by that. Uh, I am part of Research Institute for Bioscience and uh, Biotechnology. And, you know, there are a lot of representatives mm -hmm. from other independent research groups, research institutes. And one of the things is we are affiliated as NGOs with SWC. And it's just not done because it is really hindering our research work, bringing in funding from outside. And it's very discouraging to go through that bureaucratic red tape to have any sort of problem. So that's also included in the policy document and also in the implement, implementation plan. And we have strictly said it's a short term plan. Um, another is uh, expediting reviews of laws and policies for emerging and advanced technology. By the time we pass any new law, that, that, uh, you know, that uh, technology will be old already. 
right now if we go like this and dr giri was also mentioning that to pass something as simple as what he mentioned it took four months you know and by that time technology will be passing us and in this fourth uh, industrial revolution if we do not catch it we'll be missing every industrial revolution like first second third and fourth is special for us okay. because we are Nick, not can i interrupt you a little bit because we have to we have to go for the second round of yes, and we have a little time I'm left yeah so my yes. last thing is yes. we will be otherwise bound we we used to be bound by space and distance and weight as geographically locked country but now we don't have that with fourth industrial revolution so we have put that also and we have also put inclusiveness in this and overarching thing is it has to be in this interdisciplinary and we have put that too so having said this much i guess i wanted to say that it's imperative to promote technology based knowledge based innovation or knowledge based economy and we're trying to do that in implementation plan i'm only one of the person that would put in the document and then implementation part is on the government and we'll try to nudge our best to do that thank you very much sorry for thank you very much dr pande and since we don't have uh, professor arial online Uh, and this morning i think about the technical difficulties he had shared a you know a video file i just quickly go through this slide i cannot elaborate just for recording purpose so he has uh, given a slide on our university and sti policy uh, is that okay uh, session chair sir I, i just briefly you know move on this uh, slides shared by professor arial so he mainly talks about the universities in nepal you can see a lot of the universities profile the world ring uh, similarly uh, you know the achievements and the status of and compared to other countries uh, gni per capita powers of quality and power of innovation innovation superior uh, is innovation is superior than quality a uh, ring of superiority had it been online it would have been wonderful because he has uh, worked a lot uh, for this panel but is uh, we are unfortunate maybe some technical hassle must have uh, abrupted him from joining and this is our goals this is all about the presentation i think he wanted to share in the panel uh, i'm extremely sorry i couldn't do justice to his slide but just i wanted to keep it on record that he had uh looking to present in in this forum uh having heard three panelist uh sorry uh three panelist now i i move back to the first panelist uh, dr uh, ambika adhikari sir uh i have witnessed your enthusiasm to collaborate with the institution and empower its capacity with your individual effort now since you are advisor of nra and it's a big institution because you know members nepalese diaspora are scattered all over the globe they are in, in wonderful position broad so uh, what can be done through nrna uh, for making implementation of our sti policy more smooth and more effective so as as a team yep. work so i, I want to that you know that, thank you thank you that's a, that's a wonderful statement i think nrna it's last couple of days that we are seeing and rna has also has come along with uh, the diaspora group right now is a very strong and able and willing partner of development with uh, with nepal so it is not just a small number i remember that when we were young we used to be able to know and count the number of people who would leave for studies to us canada australia but now we are on the same team we can talk like dr pratibha pandey ji was saying geographically the space have have been melded the times have been melded and with the worldwide web our brains are connected so there's a lot that the diaspora can do 
<clears throat> if we look at the history of many of the countries that have done well, countries like Korea, Taiwan, or even China, Singapore, Ireland, and so on, the diaspora has been able to contribute heavily into their development because when you go out and you have an opportunity to look at the world-class science and technology, there's something you want to give back to your country. Uh, the diasporas are in a good situation. Uh, it helps because you are in a position to understand how the world-class science and technology dynamics is going on, but you also have in your memory, just like for myself, walking the hills of Bosporus for three days with barefoot. So those things are in our, in our system, in our DNA, that we know how the Nepal, Nepalese culture was, how difficult and how problematic some of the underdevelopment was, and then how life could be improved. So those are the kind of incentives utilizing the laws of science and technology, laws of physics and chemistry in making people's life easier is something that is now kind of, you know, we can see. The other point that I would make is the basic education that we do in Nepal, although it's a little bit of rote learning, the critical thinking like Dr. Pandey and, and Professor Luitel was saying, is still limited but still the structure of the basic education in Nepal is pretty sound. That you can mm -hmm. see how the medical doctors, the engineers that we taught in Pulchok and many other engineering colleges, the people who've done physics like yourself from Trivuvan University, they are the people who actually manage a lot of things with Intel, people who work in NASA, people who work with many of the large governmental organizations in some of the most developed countries in the world, and they have made a name for themselves. So. Basically, the proof is it was just the system of not being able to utilize that level of education that is hurting our society in Nepal. It's not any problem with the basic education that people have. Once you expand that, once you provide the opportunity to the same people, they have been able to prove themselves uh, uh, as, as good as anyone else. Actually, sometimes people, it's kind of very funny when people make a remark, uh, even in the U.S. when you have your colleagues and you meet with them and they say, oh, it looks like you guys had a very good uh, basic education because, you know, there's still a problem here in physics and maths and so on. Then it's very funny for us because, you know, a person like myself, we started from fifth grade and we were doing the um, uh, writing in the dust and so on. So we have a lot of things going. As a matter of fact, in the, the coming century, the 21st century, I think developing countries like ours, like Nepal and uh, places in Africa and places in South Asia are the land of opportunity. A lot of things are going to happen. The base is so low that improving on it like many of you are doing is, is something that is going to be very exciting. So I would only put a couple of things. One, once again, we make the education of science and technology glamorous, how exciting the world is, how important the information is. People like, you know, when, when I read Carl Sagan in 1980, that really opened up my eyes that Look at science, it can really explain the world. It can explain the cosmos. It can explain all the things that we experience in the world. That's the type of excitement and education that I think we can insert in science and technology in Nepal. It's not, it's a, it's not that it's a hard subject, it's a dry subject, it's not. It connects with the day-to-day -day world uh, that we do and our basic education system is not all that bad. All we need to do is reconnect, like Dr. Buju was saying, with the industry and with the commercial sector. And, uh, you know, the policies in Nepal, we do have a lot of good policies, but again, the proof is on how it can be implemented. And Dr. Dunga, like you're saying, many of us in the diaspora, I work with you and I work with NAST and Institute of Engineering when I was managing the USAID project and clean energy. There are lots of opportunities outside that we can collaborate with Nepal. There's a lot of mutual learning we can do between the Nepalese uh, groups and the diaspora groups. And these kind of uh, associations and platforms like NRNA and with this digital technology, the way that we are discussing all of this, that really helps. And it proves that whether you live in Phoenix or Toronto or Pokhara or Zumla, you can still be connected to the same level of knowledge and philosophy. Thank you so much, Dr. Dunga. Thank you, uh, sir, for uh, very encouraging words uh, and uh, very optimistic view about development of technology in Nepal. Uh, general and implementation of STI policy in particular. Now, uh, I see Dr. Anandita Bhadra online. So I think it'll be unfair not to give her a chance. 
So, Dr. Vadra, uh, can you hear? Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, you're yes. audible, absolutely. Uh, and uh, we don't have much time. We're running short of time. So, within a uh, maximum of uh, four to five minutes, can you wrap up your free opinion? But basically, yeah, I want to. Please give question. me five minutes. I'm really sorry. I had a major crash here. So. Uh, okay, please go ahead uh, without uh, losing any time, please. Yeah, Take right. So um, I will be very brief. So I represent here the Global Young Academy and uh, also the International Young Academy of Science. And uh, I will uh, give a very brief uh, idea of uh, what Uttam asked me to talk about, science policy implementation challenges and prospects. So when we talk about uh, policy of any kind, we are uh, typically talking about uh, top-down approach most of the time where we have uh, policymakers who comprise mostly of politicians and uh, bureaucrats uh, with a slight uh, dif difference in levels who are working together and then uh, they are the ones who are designing policies and then uh, they, we have implementers again through bureaucrats and institutions and then the stakeholders who are actually using the outputs uh, at the level of institutions, which comprise of people like us, the researchers, our students, and of course, members of the public. The problem that I uh, often come across in different countries, and especially in India with this top-down approach is that there is uh, not really much uh, feedback from stakeholders. Uh, there are different uh, kinds of perspectives between the ones who are designing the policy and the ones who are using the policy. And uh, often there is this one-size-fits-all approach which is obviously not true when you come to the different kinds of stakeholders which are going to be at the receiving end of the policy. And often there is a lack of implementation flexibility because of which the stakeholders are the ones who are maximally getting uh, uh, disrupted. And it is often people who are the young researchers and students who uh, then face maximum issues with this. And in addition to this, there is lack of communication lack of uh, media interests, especially when it comes to science and technology, especially in the developing countries like us. Now, uh, what would have been a better approach, obviously, is that everybody talks to each other and people work together. There is enough provision for flexibility, inclusiveness, and diversity. And there is ample feedback from stakeholders. There's communication mm -hmm. between the different parties, and there is engagement of the public media system where different stakeholders can interact with each other and uh, implement the system more flexibly. Uh, I will give you uh, the different levels in which inclusivity and diversity are missing when it comes to international uh, levels of uh, science and technology policy or academic uh, policy implementation. Of course, we talk a lot about uh, the lack of representation of women in positions of administration in academia, especially, and uh, the, the, uh, you know, the uh, leaky pipeline where women start off at the same ratio with men when it comes to schools, and then gradually as we, as we go higher up the pyramid, we fall off. Uh, of course, there is this huge issue of Black Lives Matter movement going on, but with the Black Lives Matter movement, there is also there is a lot of talk about uh, racial uh, discrimination at different levels. It's not just Black people, it's racial discrimination at multiple levels. There is lack of representation when it comes to different regions of the world, as you see in this graph uh, data showing research outputs from the different regions of the countries, and uh, lack of representation across disciplines, even in the sciences. So when you put all of that together, at another level, there is this huge diverse uh, you know, discrimination that is now coming up between applied sciences and basic sciences, whether people, governments will fund blue skies research or there is this huge thrust across the globe on funding only applied research. And we as scientists understand very well that only applied research funding will not take science very far. So there is discrimination, there is uh, lack of diversity at multiple levels, and this needs to be uh, addressed at the level of policy making, as well as at the level of implementation. So how do we assess excellence when it comes to the scientific community? Again, we have this one size fits all approach. Uh, we forget that diversity matters. We forget that different disciplines need different ways of assessment of excellence. We need to forget 
that uh, there are matrices which often do not really look at excellence, but just look at quantity. So there is this quantity versus quality debate which is going on across the world. So we need assessment which looks into diversity, which looks into... Uh, Dr. Badra, you have uh, hardly one minute left, please. Yes, I'm just wrapping up. I have one more slide. And so uh, I will give you the example of the Global Young Academy where we assess excellence uh, when we select members. We have 400 to 500 applications and we put in a lot of time and effort over months to come up with 40 selected members and we have a very, very global representation. In spite of that, we are always asking each other, are we truly global in spite of having diversity of disciplines, gender, uh, races, and 86 countries represented in our membership as of now. In India right now, if you can, if you're interested, please look up. We are having a discussion on science, technology, innovation policy. And this is where uh, the government has now finally started taking in feedback from stakeholders. Only time will tell whether this is going to be a very fruitful process at the end of implementation of this policy. So thank you for your time. And I'm really sorry for the technical glitch. Thank you. Anyway, after all, you would make it. Uh, so that's great. Now I go back to uh, Professor Nuitel. Just a, you know, one minute question uh, that you have to answer. Uh, like you talked about maker space, not only science room will work for the education promotion in the country. And that is the uh, policy, education, STI policies, main agenda. So how difficult or how could you ease to make STEM education possible in Nepal? So can you share two bullet points? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. If you, uh, just to share one slide, one, just one slide, I think- Please that, go ahead, go ahead. Sir. Yeah, that will make uh, better, I think, you know, because I have four slides. Um, my kind of thinking is that, you know, I mean, it's not just maker space, it's the perspective that we would like to, you know, we, we should be clear about science. What? Uh, yeah, Luitel, sir, I, I want uh, permission In from uh, Dr. Emra Sama. Uh, I think he's listening to us. I have sent a message in the chat. I didn't get the response because we are likely to overshoot uh, the time by 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? Because we have a break afterwards. Uh, that should be fine because the next session sure, sure, sure. is another, another room. Yeah, should be okay. So I didn't get any response from the ID team as well. Uh, in my that, that, should be, that should be okay, Dongil, sir. Because the another okay, session is another room, so there will be no overlap. Okay, great. Great. Now, uh, Professor Luitel, you can... Balchandra, sir, yes. please go ahead. I'm, I'm here, don't yes. worry. I'm here, I'm just, uh, you know, fixing again this. Okay, so what I, I wanted to just say, you know, just say a few of uh, my thoughts. Uh, one is that we need to shift our perspective from body of knowledge to more of activity. You know, some hundred years back, John Dewey, educationist John Dewey said that we are not uh, preparing students for future, but we are preparing them for present, for now. If we consider this perspective, I think we better uh, educate, you know, students in science and technology. So the, the second important, I'm, I'm giving more bullet points, Dr. Dongyal, <laughs> by the way. Okay. So uh, this okay. is my second slide. Our shift so I'm should, relaxed with the time, please go ahead. Yes, we should shift more towards reforming and transforming. For example, you know, we're teaching like definition of force. We are teaching uh, definition of energy. I think that is not enough. We should start from right from the beginning of schooling, put the students in a context. That context could be a mega respect. That, that, could be, that context could be something with some locally available tools and they work with that, you know, with, with those tools, whatever that, that can be. Local artifacts, uh, yes, that can be one tool. That's what uh, Professor Maske was, is showing. You know, anything available. For example, we, we did some activities with mat. You know, mat, Nepali mat, Nepali shukul. It has, it can be connected with science. It can be connected with maths. It can be connected with technology. You know, there are wonderful designs as you prepare those mats. So it has to connect with uh, the life and then it becomes interesting. If we, if we focus more on definition, you know, principles, uh, proofs, 
I think that is okay at some stage of our education that may be needed, but I would say that maybe not that is the thing. So science, math, technology is not only proof, you know, it's more than that. And the next is transforming, it has to connect with lives, you know, it has to connect with, for example, when we teach, use these mats and, and plants, probably we, we connect with the lives of people who work with these uh, mats and plants, probably women, women work there. So, and then we, we under, use science to understand our system, your social system, uh, our, our fabric of life. So in that way, sometimes we tend to think that culture is hurdle for us. Probably that way we reconstruct culture. Probably that is cultural revolution in a way. That is, I think, is a cultural transformation in a way. So science can be an agenda for cultural reconstruction from that perspective. So, you know, if we are to produce a better, uh, you know, better cadre for STI, science, technology, innovation, I use the word cadre, then we need, we need to actually work in curriculum. We need to work with teachers, professors, uh, and we need to work with leadership. They need a, need a vision. It's not that science happens one day. It doesn't, uh, you know, mathematical, scientific th thinking takes place a day. We need a setup. We need to start from somewhere. I agree with uh, Dr. Pandey, you know, uh, who said that it's not just the government versus us. Probably we start working as a school teachers. For example, I work with science and math teachers. I have around, you know, 50 science and math teachers. I work with them. And, and once they become leaders in their community, I think they begin, begin to improve the system where, wherever they work. So this is the kind of framework. And STI cadre, what do we mean by STI cadre? What they do, you know, how, what can we see in our children? Do we see definitions? Definitions, you know, being able to produce definitions or able to prove theorems, what we are, we are looking in them. Probably we are looking them as creator, skilled a creator, you know, and becoming more and more empathizer so that they can understand the problem and they, they are ready for a solution and they are kind of designer, uh, redesigner, uh, and uh, who can connect different disciplines and also who develop, you know, inquiry attitude. Because science is inquiry, you know, mathematics is inquiry. So if we instill this pedagogical approach, then we can rightly educate them in 21st century skills. 21st century skills is not just limited to disciplinary skills. It's a multidisciplinary and sometimes it's beyond disciplinary skills. That's why we call it STEAM education. We need art and design as well. We need- Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Luitel, because we are sunny, running short of time. You are so educator, kind of, so okay, we okay. have to learn a lot from you about the STEAM education in days ahead, how it can be implemented. So much. Uh, I, I request you to, you know, stop your presentation uh, yeah, sure, and sure. Uh, move forward to Dr. Pratibha Pandey. Uh, one quick question to you because you only in the private sector because you are you are represented uh, in the high level committee SNT. Uh, you know, coordination council member. Also, uh, the newly formed uh, the state level, provincial level university trustee. So uh, it, it's not just uh, you know you you uh, demand or suggest. You are in the implementing agency as well. So what is your next agenda to make your voice, uh, our like-minded people's voice, heard well and represented well in those? Four? So could you just say uh, in two bullet points? opinion agenda. I'll try to do that, sir. Thank you very much yeah. uh, for the question. That's a very good question. I have been thinking about this too. I took this class, uh, 15 weeks class at Harvard that talked about, it's a leadership class and it talked about how to implement, uh, um, in, you know, the different policies in uh, fragile states, fragile states like ours. And there were three A's, um, acceptance, ability, and authority. So I feel like I'm working in the intersection of acceptance, authority, and ability, and I, I plan to use all three A's. What I mean by that is representing private sector as an entrepreneur myself, I'm very much engaged and rooted to that community 
as a researcher, I'm rooted to academic committee as well, uh, meaning actively involved and also as an implementation uh, committee member with the government, I'm rooted there too. I guess that increases my three A's and the community around me, meaning uh, it'll be easier to implement things that way I don't think anything will come overnight. We need to show results and we need to show small wins first. And that's what the class talks about too. And I, I, looking at the popular examples of countries that have been able to advance, they show uh, small results first. Uh, same with Electricity Authority of Nepal, Nepal Electricity Authority, they did the same. They showed small wins that's very much visible that uh, created a lot of support from the community and then they were able to do big things. That's exactly how I plan to mobilize the community around me and the committees around me, sir. Uh, in short, that's what thank, I wanted to say. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pandey. It was short and very clear, uh, you know, message that you delivered through your uh, answer. And uh, now, I, while, you know, uh, listening you all, I just try to, uh, you know, connect our session with the global inclusion in terms of the graduates, okay? The members of the panel, actually, this uh, session panels, uh, four, including speakers, of course, four are from USA University graduates, one from Australia, the moderator, my fellow colleague, uh, and uh, one from Europe, Australia, Dr. Uh, Benil Arial. Uh, and if you consider Emra's uh, Sarma also one from UK, one from a keynote speaker from Japan, myself from Korea, uh, and Dr. Powell from China, and Dr. Badra from India. What a nice, you know, uh, representation of the global universities in the global uh, convention of uh, NRNG. So that is it. And uh, finally, I don't have to say anything. Uh, we are at the crossroad of many streaming science and technology, the development process, and also to develop science for global knowledge and technology for our, at least for our local needs. That is what is the common drive and aspiration. That's how we can ensure the prosperity uh, and happiness among Nepalese. Having said this, and now I go back to the session chair. Uh, may I request uh, our respected session chair, the secretary of Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. Uh, he has the hard task of implementation because one Korean expert rightly said to me that if the policy is not implemented, major portion of the policy is not implemented, Dungel, consider that you had ICE policy document but you have no national policy as such. So I, I, I took it very seriously. And uh, in this uh, juncture, he has the Herculean task of making it possible uh, in his career, himself being a scientist engineer. So uh, the session chair, may I request you to take the floor and conclude with your uh, you know, concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dungyal. Uh, you, you can hear me loud and clear, I hope. Yes, yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we are all in this together. Uh, Co-chair of the session, uh, Professor Dr. Badra, uh, coordinators, Dr. Dungyal and Dr. Shrestha, contributors, Dr. Boju, Dr. Podil, Dr. Giri, panelists, Dr. Adhikari, Dr. Arial, Dr. Luitel, Dr. Pandey, NRNA General Secretary, Dr. Sharma, my brother, and uh, all other uh, participants uh, in the program. Actually, I am honored to have you all uh, in this session with me today. Uh, uh, like, like Dr. Dungyal just noted, we have a very a nice mix uh, from all the different uh, universities uh, all around the world. And you know, uh, we, I think uh, you have all made uh, very valuable contributions to the program today. Uh, but uh, before, before I move on to today's, um, today's um, uh, points, I think it's my duty also to uh, address the Nepali diaspora. Uh, the contribution of Nepali diaspora is very important for Nepal's uh, socioeconomic development. It is not just the financial or capital resources that are important. Uh, the mobilization of uh, knowledge and skill is equally important, critical. So uh, in terms of uh, Nepal's uh, science, technology, innovation policy, the policy envisions to engage all Nepalese uh, within and outside the country through brain circulation uh, for technology development and transfer. The policy emphasizes the collaboration among national and international scientists entrepreneurs and investors as well. 
there is a tremendous potential in Nepal uh, with competitive advantages in water, mineral, forest resources, agriculture, and tourism, and so on. Uh, NRNs have acquired vast knowledge, uh, and they have interacted with modern markets and value chains. They have witnessed some of the fastest transformation in the countries they reside. Therefore, transferring their knowledge and skills to Nepal will be invaluable to meet the country's development challenges, be it in science technology or in other areas. The NRNs also have a global network, uh, which should be utilized to deliver tangible outcomes, not only through economic diplomacy, but also through science diplomacy. Uh, Nepal's STI policy has identified some several challenges. In particular, there is a need to make uh, scientific research and development sustainable and result oriented, and to connect such research and development with entrepreneurship, production, and productivity. Uh, as you, uh, as many of you already know, the vision of the policy is uh, that uh, the science and technology and innovation uh, is to be used for sustainable development and prosperity. The policy has made uh, several promises. Uh, the prominent upon them, in my opinion, are three uh, points. The first is the policy promises to make or create a conducive environment to make the field of science, technology, and innovation an attractive one in, in Nepal. The second point, uh, the policy promises to assign top priority to the field and ensure adequate investment in the field of science, technology, innovation. Finally, the, uh, the third point, in my opinion, uh, the policy makes a huge promise uh, that is to uh, strengthen and expand the relevant institutions, develop committed and competent human resources in the field. So you see, the policy is very comprehensive. We do have a great challenge in its implementation. And uh, therefore, uh, a lot of speculation is there. Even in today's presentations, uh, some of my uh, friends were actually uh, you know, uh, speculating that, you know, how uh, this, uh, all, all this can be made possible. So, uh, first and foremost, I think we need to create an, uh, uh, a sort of enabling environment for policy implementation. Uh, that is my view. So, in terms of uh, the enabling environment, I have uh, actually uh, outlined, you know, five elements. The first is to have a strategic plan. The second element, of course, uh, you can easily guess is the investments. Uh, there was a question on, you know, the certain percentage of the GDP being uh, being uh, invested in science, technology, uh, and, uh, and, and that is the question. The third element is, of course, uh, the institutional development. Uh, we need to restructure several uh, several institutions uh, right now, and also uh, we may need to create several new institutions as well. The fourth element, uh, naturally, is the human resource plan. We need to have, you know, a human resource plan whereby we can increase the workforce in science technology uh, in line with the SDG goal 9.5, where the SDG goal 9.5 also, uh, also uh, highlights that you know, the human resource in, in the science technology should be increased. The fifth element, uh, I would say, is the coordination mechanism. Uh, the, when we say coordination, uh, it is not only within the government, but also uh, you know, with other entities in, within Nepal and, uh, and abroad. So uh, with these five elements, I think we will, we will be able to create a sort of a conducive environment for policy implementation. Once these elements are in place, then there are certain major interventions that would be required for implementation of the policy. And among those interventions, again, I think I have five points. The first is uh, to promote scientific thinking and culture in the society. We need to really convince our top decision makers, public at large as well, that it is important to keep science, technology, and innovation on priority, not only for, the, for its own sake, but also to complement all other sectors and governance as a whole. Then uh, it is also important at the same time to promote the development of, of innovative minds from the early stages, from, from the school years. The second uh, major interventions uh, would be, you know, that there is a need to have a paradigm shift in development. We need to seek the economic prosperity through a knowledge-based economy. We need to promote innovation, entrepreneurship, and like, you know, there are several, uh, several uh, issues there, like linking the research and development with production or productivity and, and so forth. The third major intervention, of course, uh, that we discussed uh, in some, some length and breadth today is the uh, quality of education in science technology, not only in schools, but also in university level. So, so that is the major intervention. The fourth uh, intervention, I would say, 
would be to encourage researchers or scientists. We need to prevent brain drain. We need to ensure their intellectual property rights. We need to tap the intellectual capacity of Nepali diaspora and so forth. So uh, in this issue also, I think many presenters today uh, made many valuable remarks. But finally, uh, the one intervention that, that is very, very dear to me is to promote the growth of uh, professional societies. That is, that, that is something that I've been emphasizing from, uh, from the past one year, that we really need to promote the growth, growth of professional societies in Nepal. Because when we, you know, uh, when we, when we promote these societies, naturally a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, things take place because uh, in the professional societies, we have scientists which, which are in the government, we have, uh, they are in the academia, they are in the private sector, they are abroad. So, so, so we can have a nice coordination. So unless and until we uh, promote uh, the professional societies, it is very hard to promote science technology development in Nepal. Now, uh, once these elements uh, were put together, we could, uh, we could thought, we thought that we could conveniently work on these categories and we have put together several subcommittees who are now actively working to prepare action plans uh, with possible activities and projects that can be, uh, you know that can help implement the policy to a great extent many of the committee uh, members coordinators are with us today in this in this meeting uh, if, if you allow me in a couple of minutes i'll just highlight you know uh, certain game changer projects or activities or institutional structures that have been suggested proposed so far in the in the discussions the first is the uh, i think today also dr pandey and others uh, other friends have suggested this uh, we have, um, uh, it has been proposed to establish a national, national Research Council or a Science Technology Innovation Foundation. Uh, these, uh, you know, these agencies could, could facilitate the um, uh, several uh, research organizations in the private sector. They could also administer, administer a research and development fund if, if such a fund uh, becomes, you know, possible. So uh, basically, a council or a foundation is deemed necessary. Uh, for that purpose, we may need to promulgate some law or amend the present laws uh, as well. The second game changer project um, uh, or activity that has been proposed is the uh, you know, establishment or restructuring of the innovation ecosystem. Uh, you know, like uh, there is a kind of a public-private partnership required. We need to really develop platforms for young innovators. We need to develop innovation hubs. We need to scale up innovation for production of value added goods and so forth. So uh, the so kind of innovation ecosystem is, is needed. Another uh, suggestion is uh, uh, to develop uh, research centers as you know, centers, centers of excellence in priority areas. And for that purpose, actually, we already have a program uh, in, in the current year. We have, we have begun preparations to do a feasibility study uh, for this purpose. Uh, and it is important here to uh, you know, identify redundancies among various existing institutions, and we really want to, you know, uh, want to uh, uh, strengthen the existing institutions rather than just go on going on creating new institutions. So, strengthening of the existing institutions, and wherever necessary in some provinces, we would like to have new centers of excellence. Another um, another suggestion that has uh, uh, that is uh, very important is the development of a multidisciplinary research center and accreditation lab. And uh, on this also, we are doing some work. We have, uh, we have started to prepare a, a, a plan on this one. Another, another suggestion is the establishment of technology parks. And similarly, there are suggestions for the promotion of industrial internship-based technical education, uh, development of incubation centers, uh, in incentives for industries to invest in R&D, support research and commercialization of indigenous uh, knowledge-based products and so on. Uh, finally, uh, there is uh, this uh, suggestion on uh, intellectual property protection policies and patent provisions and so forth. And I already mentioned the uh, supporting professional societies and researchers as one of the, uh, one of the suggestions. And I think uh, on all these elements, the uh, you know, uh, keynote speaker today, the presenters and uh, panelists, have contributed uh, greatly to further consolidate and uh, improve these ideas uh, that have been generated so far. Even though I have tried to make a note of your valuable thoughts and views, if I try to summarize those views, I think it will take a long time. Also, I cannot do full justice. So I'll skip that part and just try to conclude the session, if you allow me.
In conclusion, I wish to thank all the coordinators, the co-chair of the session, all the presenters, panelists, also the participants and the organizers today. Uh, I wish to extend my thanks to all the subcommittee members, coordinators, uh, who are uh, actively working to prepare the action plans. Uh, tirelessly, they are working. Uh, the STI policy uh, should not be viewed just as a government document. Rather, it is a national document. We all uh, own this document. Rather than trying to judge how the government or the ministry implements it, I think I urge everyone to come forward and contribute. Now is the time, as we are uh, preparing a strategic plan to implement this policy. We need all the help that you can uh, possibly extend. I take this opportunity to extend my greetings to uh, Nepalese in the country and in the diaspora for the upcoming festivals of Dasani Tihar, Nepal Sambat, uh, Chhat Parva, and so on. My best wishes to Nepalese home and abroad. May you all enjoy a COVID free festival and new year. And with that, I think I would like to conclude this session. Uh, I think we have, a very, we have had very valuable uh, discussions, uh, which, will be, which will go a long way to, uh, to finalize our uh, action plan uh, for the policy implementation. And uh, I think uh, we'll very soon we'll be able to see a document which will uh, uh, try, to, uh, try to implement the policy to a great extent. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your insightful thoughts and uh, presenting the roadmap of the implementation of STI policy and uh, requesting on behalf of the most of the session and session coordinators, uh, we are grateful to you for accepting our request to chair the session and uh, give us valuable time and insights uh, on it. And on behalf of coordinators, once again, uh, I, I'd like to thank the keynote speaker, invited speakers, panelists, and everybody who attended so sincerely. And last but not the least, very important person of this convention, Dr. Uh, Hemra Sarma. Actually, uh, Professor Binil Arial could not join us and is replaced. I'm replaced in a way, complemented by another physicist. Uh, we feel proud to say that is leading the convention. Dr. Hemra Sarma is here to extend formal vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee. Uh, Dr. Sarma, floor is yours now. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me now? Looks like yes, sure. there's a problem with my internet. Uh, Sorry for that one. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dungal uh, and Dr. Fleshter uh, uh, for putting this uh, wonderful uh, session together. Uh, it has been a long journey when uh, I met Dr. Dungal and actually Dr. Sharma in January uh, about organizing uh, this session. Uh, well, there, there were lots of ups and downs because of the uh, COVID, but finally uh, we uh, made it a very uh, fruitful uh, session. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bozu, uh, for his tireless effort on the science and technology policy. Uh, actually, he was the he was a session chair of the last uh, conference about the science and policy uh, technology, uh, science and policy, science and technology policy. And then uh, we made lots of recommendations uh, in the first conference. And later, when uh, he was drafting the uh, policy, and he provided opportunity to us. Uh, to give our feedback, and I think uh, those were implemented uh, in the um, policy, and we will be happy to uh, help uh, to implement this uh, policy now. Uh, I like the Venn diagram. I think NRME can be part of all three circles in the Venn diagram, uh, from investment point of view, from uh, sharing the knowledge and so on. Um, well, uh, also, I li I'm glad to see there are so many young uh, scientists are back to Back to Nepal and uh, trying to do something for nation. Uh, they should be a role model. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ram Chandra and uh, Dr. Basant Agri, and Uttamji himself is a role model for the young uh, scientists uh, in Nepal and also to the diaspora. Uh, I think we should really follow their path. Uh, well, as uh, Dr. Ambika uh, Adhikari indicated, NRNA is trying to bring all diaspora experts together and breeze between various uh, governmental organizations and professionals in Nepal and abroad uh, through a platform like this knowledge convention or we have various other entities actually we're trying to build a different department in science and technology uh, transfer under the leadership of one of the vice president Anakesi. 
uh, and then we are also developing another institution called NRNA Policy Institute. And I think in near future, uh, we'll have like a permanent body to work uh, with the various organizations uh, in, in Nepal. Uh, and finally, I think there are lots of areas we can already work together without waiting government resources or policies. Like, I always believe in collaboration because I, I, I'm in Europe and how these European countries work together for times. That's a, that's a wonderful networking opportunity. I think I can see like, um, there's, there's a global community here and then uh, there's lots of way to, to work together. Um, and I always believe in person to person relation and collaboration. That helps to quite a lot to work on the ground level rather than thinking resources or policy in the higher level. A simple example like student exchange, knowledge exchange, writing paper together. And there are lots of things we can go, go together. And then I think uh, our colleagues who are in, in Nepal, they, they have done lots of things. Uh, they publish uh, world-class uh, papers, sometimes better than ours. I sh we should really encourage from government point of view, I think government should encourage those people who have gone back and trying to do something. And we at NRN will try our best uh, to breeze uh, uh, between uh, diaspora community and scientific community as well. Thank you, it's a wonderful session. I thank you all once again. Thank you. <laughs> Namaskar, everybody. Thank you. Next thank session, you. Room number one. I, I, IT support team, please take over now. Close the session. Thank you. <laughs>